the whole meeting of Board of Education School District number 40 at 6 p.m. On, mon on tonight, Monday, September 12th, in the Coolidge Professional Development Center. Can I have a roll call? Audrey Adamson. Here. Justin Anderson. Present. Chet DeSmet. Here. Kate Schaefer. Here. Maria S. Trigueros. Andrew Weyert. Here. Aaron Waldron Smith. Here. All right. Um, may I have approval of the minutes from the Committee of the Whole meeting of May 9th of 2022. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have any we'll move that to the other Correct. meeting okay um so we have a english learners update by mrs perkins um first of all i wanted to thank you for letting me share all of the great things that we've been doing um i asked a team of uh, people representing all parts of our programming to just share a little bit with you uh, um, at all levels. So I'd like to take a moment and just introduce uh, the team that's with me tonight. I'm Leslie Perkins, the coordinator for English Learners. This is my third year, um, beginning my third year in this role. Um, and then we have Chris Moore. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> First year now, it's festival. So. Um, Jose Castro is here. World language, Bob and I have Rachel McCoy. I'm dual language at John Muir. And Caitlin Hillier. I'm K1 at Washington Elementary. Um, so I wanted to uh, give you a look at our numbers. Uh, but before that, I wanted to remind you that in, in our um, programming, we have two main strands. We have that TBE, the transitional bilingual education, that our dual language would be considered in there. And any building that has a group of 20 or more students who speak the same language would be part of that uh, TBE programming by the state. The TPI is our transitional program of instruction. It's the ESL uh, programming that's required for any language groups less than 20, so 19 and below. So just uh, those two strands are, are just important to kind of keep in mind. So looking at our numbers, um, I've included some trends and I've included that in your handout as well. Um, I really wanted to highlight that um, in our buildings, we've seen um, recently an uptick in our numbers. Um, and I've circled the, the buildings that have approximately 20 or more from last year to this year. So you can kind of see that in eight of our buildings, we've seen a significant increase um, in these numbers. And the others are also increased uh, even by a few. And I will point out that these are beginning of the year trends. So we still, um, now that we're getting state ID numbers for some of our newcomers, we can generate tickets to screen them. But this is before screening our new students based on their home language surveys. So um, again, I, I anticipate seeing that number grow even to next month. Um, I wanted to celebrate all of the wonderful work that our teams across the board have been doing. And we'll go into these because our teams are also going to talk a little bit more about that at their levels. Um, but in particular, I wanted to um, uh, highlight the continued support from Amy Mosquera, who is our dual language consultant. Uh, we are gradually releasing from, from her role, so we have less and less days every year, but she is still a, a support. She's in our district today, um, and she helped with some strategic planning so that we can uh, make sure we're continuing that momentum uh, of improvement. Um, I'd also like to really highlight the Elevation platform, which is a platform that we've invested in to help our teachers get strategies um, for modifying instruction for all of their EL students and um, look at the data because it will highlight and target um, student data and not only that student data where they are on the access scores, but um, what students can do at that level. So the teachers get a really good picture of what their students should be able to do. I also think it's worth highlighting the new ESL position at the John Deere Middle School so that we can align our ESL programming between both middle school settings and help those students who are not in the dual language program, um, as well as the new ESL position, which was an internal move at the high school. Um, so I think overall, we're, we're seeing some really good things. 
in our programming. We also have an amazing partnership with WIU. Um, and through that, we're able to grow our own uh, teachers by offering them um, a discounted rate for that ESL certification. We've got some language and play coaching happening. So that is going to impact our kids' um, work and that pace goal. Um, we've got some alternative pathways to certification to also help with the teacher shortage by taking some of our vested paras who are already um, um, faithful and loyal and, and believe in our Moline School District and helping them to get an accelerated pathway towards that certification. Um, and we have established parent mentor programs. We've added another building this year and we have the opportunity to potentially add one more. Um, which are programming to really bring in parents and teach them how to work with their children and work with children within the buildings. So um, I want to highlight our seal of biliteracy. Um, this year we had a total of 16 students, um, including five juniors, which are the most um, juniors we've had pass this test um, and pass the, they have to do, they have to um, prove their proficiency in their native language. French and Spanish are what we offer and um, have a minimum score on their SAT. And so um, these students all achieve that this year. Uh, looking a little bit more in depth of how our programming is broken down, we have an ex extremely diverse uh, group of students across our district. Um, we have 68 identified languages. Um, and our most frequent in the top 10 are Spanish, French, Burmese, Awe, Arabic, Dari, Swahili, Hindi, and Pashto. And I would point out that Dari and Pashto are the two new language groups from our Afghan students. So they're already in our top 10. <laughs> um, looking at our numbers, I'm, I'm going to be keeping track of our monthly enrollment for EL. Um, so I looked at August, our first day of school, and then every first Friday of the month, I'll be adding to this graph so that we can kind of see how our numbers are growing over the year. Hopefully that'll be, give us a, a better idea of maybe what to expect for next year and how we can uh, prepare for that better. Um, we also have 44 um, Afghan students as of today. Tomorrow that number is going to grow because we have a family coming in to register tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> I presented uh, this exciting data before, but I took a look at all of our um, uh, last year's MAP scores and compared our former English learners, which is going to be a new indicator on our um, Illinois State Report card, um, to our to the rest of um, their never English learner peers. So kids who have never been native English speakers, essentially. And we align with national trends that our former English learners outperform all other groups of students on MAP reading and MAP district-wide. Um, and that is in both, both tests. Um, so to me, that the big aha or the takeaway is that we need to make sure that we get all English learners to be former English learners. That means exiting within those five to seven years uh, by providing them the, the best opportunities for learning and growth during that really pivotal time where they're really uh, going to have the most impact. For our dual language versus the traditional ESL instructional model, um, remember I talked about that TBE and TPI. Uh, the big difference for the TBE programming is that native language instructional piece. Um, and when I look at, compare the two, um, Data points, our dual language model also aligns with that national trend data that um, dual language is a superior model. And so my takeaway from that is what pieces from our dual language teaching instructional model can we pull into our language groups where we can't have that native language instruction to make it um, more powerful as well. So now I'm gonna hand over to Chris to talk a little bit about the achievements at the high school. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're excited. As many of the schools did, we, we present um, the faces of our students. We, have, we always like to remember that these are the faces for whom we are advocating and for whom we uh, work to support every day. Some of the successes we'd like to summarize um, 
one of the most recent developments is we were, you know, we have an influx as other schools do of Afghan refugee students, many of whom know very little to no English at all. And it's a very large building. And so we have utilized our Grow Your Own students um, in our Grow Your Own program to partner with our refugee students to get them around the school and to orient them. And we thought, I think that was an amazing uh, use of those prospective teachers. Of course, we're in our second year of dual language at the high school. So I'm very excited that we had five juniors get the seal of high literacy. I only expect that number to go up as we get that, those dual language cohorts to come in, in subsequent years. Uh, we were lucky to have an internal transfer of one, an, an additional EL teacher to meet our uh, ever growing demand um, for services for these students. Um, as pointed out earlier, 16 students are in the seal of high literacy. And then our teachers, besides the district access to elevation, our own teachers at MHS uh, during, on the professional development committee have elected, they've asked for ele faculty wide elevation training, which to me speaks volumes about our staff and how they want to better uh, serve the EL students who are in their classrooms. We, of course, challenges, challenges uh, continue. Um, as you know, the, the numbers are there, the population is growing exponentially. We are trying to think of more and more innovative ways to use the limited resources we have to meet those needs. Um, so far in EL courses, we have English and social studies, half of those core subject areas uh, protected for those beginning EL students so they can continue to get um, their English support um, in subject areas. We are looking, we would like to see that same thing for math and science so that we can um, provide a clearer pathway uh, for those students who need that extra assistance in, in those kind of self-contained classrooms. An additional, because of that, we want to make sure that our seniors who, we had many five seniors and nine juniors qualified on the Spanish or French side of the seal by literacy, but um, just came short on the English side. And so I'm hoping that that elevation training that we do faculty-wide will help us differentiate for those students so that we can bring those SAT scores up and we can get that true biliteracy uh, recognition. Uh, building a, a community of newcomer learners um, to access support. We've, uh, I really have to give kudos to our counseling department. They've worked together with EL and done some amazing innovations in scheduling uh, to make sure that we can keep most of, for example, our Afghan students together during the day. If we don't have anyone to translate, they can only help each other. And so we've been trying to do what we can um, Another one, the cafeteria menu, kind of standard cafeteria items uh, that aren't always um, consistent with uh, differing dietary restrictions or uh, customs. And so we've added some kind of pictorial symbols to make sure, for example, pork is displayed so students can make appropriate choices. Again, we're constantly trying to find new ways to communicate with parents in ways that we can reach them uh, with their work schedule, with, their, with, with the language uh, barriers we face. Uh, and uh, we are, have uh, Mike Thierry, who is a former Spanish teacher at the high school, has done an amazing job in the bilingual support classroom. And for the periods that we do have him during the day, he's extremely helpful. So we do rely on his support a great deal. So I, I give credit to the entire EL team um, at the high school for what we've done. The challenges will continue, but we're going to continue to meet them. Um, so like, like Mr. Moore said, I just to start off our slides with some faces of our EL and dual language students. Um, many of our students are recognized throughout the building as students of the month for being respectful, responsible, and ready students at John Deere. And I also wanted to highlight some of their engagement in um, different learning activities at school. So our successes, I feel, um, adding dual language at the middle school level is not done very often. Um, most dual language programs run K through five, and there's not a lot of resources out there for middle and high school. So we had to design our own curriculum with the help of Amy Mascara, and I feel like we've come up with a really, um, really well-developed and rigorous uh, curriculum for our dual language students. Since I've been at John Deere and the dual language program has started, we've had added two additional dual language staff members. So we now can offer language arts and social studies in the dual language program. And like Leslie highlighted earlier, we've been able to add that full-time ESL staff member to assist the students who are not part of our dual program. 
Uh, we've been able to purchase updated curriculum materials for both dual language and ESL with a lot of input from staff members on those curriculum materials. We've had eight of our staff members, not ESL um, staff members, complete the uh, ESL cohort through WIU. So we now have eight additional teachers with their endorsements teaching in content areas. And especially this year, we have been able to increase the diversity of our student population. So that's a big positive for us. Um, some of our challenges are we still are in need of some of those bilingual staff uh, support staff members like Paris and Chai's to help support our students when they're out in the general education classrooms. Um, we are still looking for different ways to find time for collaboration to help those non-ESL and non-bilingual staff members with differentiation for their instruction and assessment. And again, that home communication piece when we don't have um, the, the languages to communicate with our families at home. I wanted to start by highlighting some of the growing diversity and languages that we're seeing at Washington Elementary. So the first chart that you'll see is 14 different languages spoken completely in all of Washington. And the second chart is seven different languages that are spoken just within my classroom setting. And the reason I show this is because I personally feel that this is a success to our EL program. So we're seeing these growing numbers, but that's due to the work that we're doing. So some of the celebrations and successes. So our EL ratio to student population at Washington. So we actually have a large enough ratio, EL ratio that we have an EL classroom at every single grade level. And with that, we also are very fortunate that we have a certified EL staff member at every single grade level as well. Um, as Leslie already touched on, so elevation. So we're able to target areas that students need more work in and go in and use strategies with that program. At Washington, we've been using Class Dojo, which is a, a parent and teacher communication program. It's an app that parents can use. And this is nice for parents that don't speak English because there is an option for a translation button. And most of our families have the option with, for it to be in their home language. Um, on the translations, we actually have two parent mentors that became translators within our school district, and that really helps take the load off of us for uh, parent-teacher conferences and for conferences that we have just after school outside of the school setting. Um, with our Arabic-speaking population and with our Burmese-speaking populations, which have continued to rise. Some of our continued challenges kind of go along with what others had said. With our growing numbers, we have a lot of newcomers coming in. So finding resources that are appropriate for those students, um, communicating face-to-face. -face. So when we don't have those translators available or when we do not have class dojo to communicate with parents. And then also, even though we are certified K through five, just finding the support staff, getting them into the cohorts and getting them ESL certified as well. So um, moving forward, we know um, <clears throat> we're, we feel very proud of the work that we've done, but we also know that we've got, we're not done, we've got continued work to do. Um, and so because we've seen district trends continue to rise rapidly, we know that we must prepare for that continual growth in numbers um, through enhanced systems and creative solutions, right? Um, and I feel like we've We've been really successful doing that um, this year so far, and I think that we just need to know what's coming in order to prepare better for that. Because we continue to show data that aligns with national trends, with former ELs and dual language, we, we must continue to provide support and professional development across all settings to ensure that program fidelity um, is, is continued um, across all schools, all settings. Because we are growing rapidly at all levels and on all areas, we must continue to proactively increase our district capacity through that EL cohort, but also um, through trainings, making sure we have that EL lens put into all things as we continue to grow with the EL numbers in, in all settings. And because we have many wonderful systems in place to positively impact ELs, we must leverage our practice and our resources uh, to really make sure we continue to reach those English learners um, in our buildings. Um, and so with that, I wanted to, again, highlight the trends and then 
taking a look at the projections out five years, it looks like in about five years, if we continue the way that we have, um, our numbers are going to be about double from where we are now. And so just knowing this, um, I think, helps us to better prepare and put into place those systems and structures in our buildings to make sure we can really have the same success um, in the future. I have a quick question. Uh, Mr. Moore talked about in the cafeteria having the signs so students know what they're eating or don't eating with their culture. Do we have that at the middle school and the elementary? Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, yes, Steve. Maybe I should also. Don't forget the elementary, they only have one option. Mm -hmm. So that's not as imperative as the other, but it is a good idea. Yes. Whereas the middle school and, and high school, I know we call it a limited menu, it's not a restaurant, but the choices at the high school are robust and middle school as well. But we can definitely implement the, line, uh, the signage at, at the middle school and the elementary, even though it's not stuff. But we encourage the elementary parents all the time to go to the web. And if you talk about a parent and on the board members yourself, you might remember this. You did print out the menu and then you would probably talk about it with your children. And do you want to take this lunch? or do you want to bring your own? So we encourage that all the time. And uh, that's probably the best, but the signage is probably a good addition. I think um, we've had multiple meetings in the buildings that have the new Afghan students. And that's always a recommendation of mine is to somehow like notify, put a picture up. Um, Chris Moore actually drew a picture and placed it on the options. Um, I'm not sure how other buildings are identifying it, but that is always a conversation that we have as these buildings have these students. Um, one issue I would point out with the menu is that um, our um, brand new families from Afghanistan are not always familiar with like the fact that pepperoni pizza might have pork in there. And so having a way to communicate that outer might be a, a consideration moving forward as well. Thank you. Yes. Um, two questions. At the beginning, you talked about making sure all of our ELL hopefully become former ELL. What sort of do our numbers look like of those that end up persisting past that five to seven years that we end up not moving them into that where they're, we're seeing those higher rates of achievement? Do we have kind of a, uh, an idea of numbers? How many students are what we term long-term learners? Yeah. Um, so our program elevation does calculate that out. Um, currently, I believe we're at about 150 long-term learners, that means they've been in the program beyond seven years. Um, generally, we're going to see them at the high school. And um, I know Chris can probably speak a little more and Heather um, to the fact that um, our students, by the time they're a long-term learner at the high school, they're definitely more at risk um, for behavior attendance issues. Um, a lot of times they're not achieving the way we would like to see them in general. Would you like to add anything else, Jose? Yeah, I was going to say, in order for them to pass access at the high school, it's like they are college ready. So that's why for the seal by literacy, if you get a 4.8 on their access, that's like scoring uh, college ready in your ACT or SAT. So that's a big challenge at the high school that we have. It, it is a big, um, it's a national challenge. The long-term learners are, are a big topic of conversation at pretty much any um, at bilingual conference or um, um, gathering because everybody has experienced this and we're the, but the idea is really what can we do I mean what can we do for these kids but what can we do to prevent this how can we make it the best possible program so that we can get them through and have them have that success as a former EL piggyback off that yeah. real quick can yeah. I give another one do you think that that's a trend that is because the program wasn't in place or is that something that's it's, okay. it's, um, it's, I would say, um, there's a lot of historical data with long-term okay. learners. It's not, um, cause I know we're making steps to improve. So I'm yes. wondering, is that, is that what we're seeing this realm or is this just a trend? No, I think it's, it's a national trend. Okay. It's a national trend that there are long-term learners who, um, for mobility purposes, they don't have continued continued services, or um, their education is interrupted in some way, or 
maybe it was a high quality experience at some point and not necessarily even in our district, but just along the way. Um, and so it's, it's just uh, something that we do need to figure out how we can mitigate and make it better. The other question I said is I know that, I mean, moving forward as we see these numbers increase, I mean, we'll definitely need more staff that are trained and all of that, which I know then we're competing for staff with a lot of other districts also of individuals that need the skills and, and that we, we need. But, but also, are there other tools or other sort of things that we, based off of trends that are out there, that we should be looking forward and the board should be <clears throat> needing to look to be supporting um, to help us be ready for this increase? Um, well, I think the board has supported incredibly with elevation because that is something that um, we pay by student, but every single teacher in the district has access to. Teacher, chai, administrators, special ed, um, instructor, speech language pathologist, whoever it is, everybody has access. Um, everybody can see where their students are and they can also access that strategies piece to be able to figure out how they can um, maybe um, accommodate that, their instruction for that student's particular language level. And that's, I think, one of the biggest things because it's targeted and individualized to their students. Um, other than that, I mean, I, the ESL cohort to be able to grow our own staff is a huge help, um, just to be able to make sure that we can internally have those positions filled as much as possible. Um, and then again, like I, as we look forward, um, having that EL lens when we look at you know, district-wide trainings um, as much as possible, provide that professional development to, to everybody who may feel a little uncomfortable with what do I do with, with students who speak another language. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <clears throat> Right, and now we have an elementary and secondary education plans from Dr. Pribble and Dr. Devane. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, after uh, the board goal planning session, uh, we wrapped, wrapped around some discussion points for, <clears throat> for how to end up taking some of the, the items that the board discussed and making it a reality um, and start growing with it in regards to communication um, strategy. So what we did was we talked over the summer and we, my computer would stop freaking out. We talked over the summer and then in August, we worked with uh, principals to talk about what are structures for communication that we want to end up doing. And sorry about this. Craig, I might need tech support here. I'm not getting my full screen. I know. It's Monday. It's very Monday. Very Monday. Where's presenter? All the time. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's not just something we feel a whole lot better. Yeah, why don't you go? Yeah. Thank you, though. Yeah, that's that to me. I don't know answer. Should just keep going. And uh, here it is right here. Yes, the presentation. Here. Should go. All right, well, we're running. Let's try that again. Yeah. <laughs> so great to be here. Uh, so as I was saying, 
So we ended up listening from uh, when, when the board came together to end up discussing the uh, uh, board goals and, and improvements. And we looked at, uh, you know, what type of general communication can we do at an elementary and a secondary level? Then we ended up working with our principals with a simple question to end up saying, you know, what are the communication levels that we need to be uh, committed to for our stakeholders and what do they look like? Um, Brian's going to go quite a bit into Class Dojo because I know there's some questions about it, but um, there's really two main slides to this. One is going to end up being where Brian's going to end up talking about what elementary's doing, and then there's a secondary slide too, so you can end up seeing what's the general gist. So I'll let Brian take it here. Yeah, I just added some slides literally like five minutes ago. So, um, <laughs> but uh, so and well, because I, I, you know, we talked about Class Dojo. We heard about Class Dojo in discussions, and um, the good news is uh, a lot of our elementaries are already using Class Dojo, Dojo at some level. But um, with Teresa Sanders on board, um, I ran this plan by her, talked to, try to familiarize her with a little bit of elementary, and and she created a beautiful plan. Um, to put together for the buildings that weren't implementing dojo full scale. But here's some of just the highlights of what we want to do. We want to unify class dojo at all 10 elementaries. We want to make sure we get all teachers enrolled. We want to make sure we get all students rostered and parents signed up. We want to do that quarter one. And then we also want to start those weekly teacher posts, which are individual for the, the teacher to the parents in that individual classroom, and then also the principal posts as well. Um, so, and Dojo, the one thing about Dojo that adds, it's just not just a communication tool. We call it a positive uh, culture builder because we tie in the skills and the behaviors. And that's something that we've accounted for in the plan that is kind of detailed if you look at it. But if you, you know, think about an elementary building teacher that's not using Dojo, right? And we say, hey, we're going we're gonna to go to Dojo this year and even a principal in that situation. So we've put a very... A uh, simple, simple plan together that allows for the implementation over time. And what we find, what we're finding is buildings that aren't on board with full-scale dojo will probably be moving quicker than this plan, but we wanted to give them enough time and enough planning to make sure that they felt comfortable using it. So this is available. We can share it with you if you want to get into detail about it. Um, just one of the things that, because I, I was a big uh, uh a fan of dojo as a building principal and uh, actually uh, created this this is not anything that uh, you can find on the internet it actually came out of our building when we first implemented it. and what i like about it is it really explains dojo puts the building admin in the center the student teacher communication the teacher parent communication and that that communication is what really builds that positive culture piece and you know what we're finding and what we hear a lot right now is uh Teachers have a hard time getting a hold of parents via phone, but when you text them, right, like they, they answer. And Dojo allows that confidential piece that allows that one-to-one -one communication. And the other thing about it, too, uh, is that the positive culture piece with the skills and the behavior, that is documented and that's recorded and that's archived. And um, we're really uh, been working on our RTI process and our tier one tier two and tier three interventions, and that data is essential for those um, having those discussions with students. So here's an example. I'm kind of proud of this. Actually, I got this text today um, from my daughter's classroom, and there's a lot there, so I got to go over that tonight. And, and see what's there. I'm going to be honest. Like, I was like, oh, man, that's our first one. But then here is, uh, here is uh, Mr. Putnam. You know, put him on the spot. He's one of our newest principals, right? Um, and uh, just check this out. This is Franklin. I just pulled this a little bit ago. He's already put this video here is asking for parent input. He's asking for some parent input. So he did a video, but check out the school insights. 135 messages sent to families. That's today. This was last week. And that was the first week, full week. And you got some videos and you got positive feedback. So, you know, just really awesome that we're already seeing implementation. And, and you know, Franklin, having a new admi administrator at the at the helm there and already diving in deep into you know what the district what we're trying to do it's exciting to share so any questions on dojo i have a quick question yeah. um so i know when she was talking about it does you can convert it to a different language but what about a language that's not part of dojo what do we do for parents then well i believe we have translation services okay, so that, it, that we have available okay, thank you Right, Leslie, I'm going to defer to you on that. We've got lots of uh, okay. different Thank options you. for that. Thank you. Thank Jackie you. coordinates that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So we, we also utilize a translation service too. We have translation service and we have in house 
Yep. Yeah. Copious options. We just have one. Anything? I'm not turning over six. All right, here's the secondary. Um, you won't find this on the internet either. <laughs> uh, so uh, when we came together as um, as a secondary, we ended up coming with the, the, the concept of we're going to scaffold in and grow with some ways to end up enhancing some communication. Also with the notion, too, that if you have too many communication paths shooting off at different angles, you actually can get confusing, you know, having parents going into too many things. So what we're doing is for the middle schools, uh, right now there's a weekly team newsletter that we're going to make sure to put out. The high school said, well, our weekly communications, we're going to end up making sure that we're publishing a weekly then at a monthly level, the building principals are gonna have a monthly newsletter that I'll end up going out. This is new in particular for, for the middle schools who relied heavily for the parents' communication through team. And the idea with this that would end up going out is that this, this monthly uh, information for parents would really end up being like, what are some key information that you needed to go moving forward? And then so what's some highlights that are happening inside the building, which we thought was important. Of course, you know, we're always going to continue to utilize pushing out notifications before key uh, events. The difference that you're going to start seeing, and we've already gotten this out in uh, communication uh, through Candace, is that we're going to start learning and start moving more communication through the Remind platform. It does a few things for us. Uh, one, it's such a quick and easy uh, communication. You're directing people to, to one area. We're going to end up having um, specialized professional development for our secondary principals coming up. Um, we wanted to get the school year started. We don't want to be too tone deaf on them. Um, so uh, they're going to end up having that. And then we're going to utilize um, our resources through EdTech and Shannon Harding that once we start kicking off at the building level, the more teachers who want to start using it, then we can start scaffolding that, those pieces in as well. The interesting thing in talking as, as a large group is the difference of social media platforms. Um, middle school really still pushes a lot to Facebook. Uh, high school utilizes Twitter. And the reason being is you have so many boosters, clubs, organizations, and they're predominantly using Twitter so that they can follow, repost, and everything like that. That's the, that's the key differences between the middle schools and the high school. Now, I would tell you this that we're proud of. We've talked, Dr. Savage and I have talked about it a few times. If you go to our Deer uh, Facebook page and if you go to our Wilson Facebook page, <clears throat> Uh, they're being ran by two new administrators, and they talk, and they're in, they're often in tandem. It's not like when one posts, the other has to post. But the uh, Facebook pages right now are very alive. Big uptake. Yeah, big up, uptake to that one. Yeah, uh, we coordinate with the PR director, and then I I really have to end up giving a kudos to um, our secondary administrators. This at the bottom, um, Aaron, your question about it, the translation pieces, you know, that's really, really big. We, we always feel like we have to end up looking at through the lens of the Spanish and French translation, you know, because as you've seen, ironically, through, through Leslie's presentation and her team, you know, those are, after English, you know, those are two predominant uh, languages, and then we can use translation services for the rest of them. But we always have to keep this um, focus. Thank you. I have a question and a comment. Yeah. The weekly reminder thing cracks me up because I just got my remind and it's like pictures are tomorrow. So I went home and I'm like, where's the paper? <laughs> For, I mean, that is so helpful as a parent that this is what's coming up. And then my question is for Twitter, but those are all under an umbrella that's yes. with the moly. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Yep. And we're actually um, this Thursday when we have administrator professional development, we'll be working with our principals to go in and vet all of the accounts that are associated with the school. All employees will get the social media uh, pro proper procedure training through Public Works, and that will be coming out soon. The principal is ultimately responsible for any site that's managed or that's affiliated with the school. And so they have the uh, final oversight but we'll go in and ask them to make sure that everything is up to date, their accounts, who's managing them. If they're an employee, they'll automatically get the district training. If they're not an employee, um, as an example, some of our parent mentors in some schools might be helping with that. Then they get trained uh, by a uh, face-to-face -face meeting. They sit down and, and go over the procedures and sign off and that principal is ultimately responsible. So that's happening uh, this week. Um, and Brian, could I have that? 
slide Joel sent to me so I could do it where you have the in-depth slide. I'm too blind to see it. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll show you that out. Thank you. I'd like to see it as well. Can you, you, you want, yeah, we've got that in a separate doc. Yeah. So you just want the plan? Yes, I yes. just want it because I couldn't read it. Yeah. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, and then we have cheaters. Um, here's no. HVAC update by Mr. McDermott. But why aren't these things? And that's the <laughs> action that I see. But the last real update we had was six months ago. So we'll probably have six in six months. I'll have my last one. So, so you're getting done with me. So with that, I really want to talk to us because to put things in perspective, we've come a long way in, in facilities just in my career. I have now two things I'm asking you to approve tonight on the consent agenda at the board level that equals $10 million. That's more than the first project I did in 2007 to 2008 when Bicentennial. It's more than that building cost. But that's how far we've come because that was 30 years prior was the first time we did new square footage at Bicentennial School. So we went 30 years at the district without adding any new square footage. Now it's come so efficient and ongoing from a basis of the 1% sales tax and what we prioritize as a school district that I'm asking you to do $10 million worth of projects on a consent agenda. So that is very impressive. It's scary a little bit though. I'm not gonna yes. lie. Okay, Aspire completed. Let's just not talk about that anymore. HVAC ongoing. Adams, we have the chiller and route. What does that mean? You should probably get it in the next 10, 14 days. Good news. Won't get it for any air condition this year, but good news. Butterworth Elementary, uh, same thing. Chillers and route, we should get it in 10 to 15 days, but there's, a, there's still some hiccup with uh, electrical panels that were on order and we're supposed to get them shipped at uh, the middle of this month. So that one definitely won't have air conditioning before they this uh, this year. Logan, we have the chiller. We have the steel that is supposed to be in route. So there is a chance that we could have that one done by the end of the month. Great. Wilson, middle school, we're pretty much done wrapped up with that one. So that's good. Other projects that, that we had over the summer and that are lingering on are Deer and Wilson Auditorium electrical updates that we've been working on for year four or five years. Uh, Wilson uh, is gonna be bid out this year. Deer is being uh, done over the fall. Life health safety projects, we pick off one or two schools a year. There's a lot of door hardware at the high school that we repurpose some of the old doors from Aspire into the other ones that were right. But now we got to do an RFP because by the amount of money we have to spend for the door hardware for the life health safety is over, oh, probably over $20,000. LED, the, uh, the Willard update. Uh, is it for the LEDs is, is complete. So we're down to about four buildings left. So that's good news. Uh, upcoming projects, HVAC. We have $10 million to do the two Lincoln Irving uh, and Washington elementaries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Your roofs, you see, we have two uh, on the agenda today for the J-Wing at the high school and Wilson, the auditorium in A-Wing. And then miscellaneous, we have, you know, the painting at the East Gym now in Aspire. We got that to hopefully being done over the winter break. Bleachers, the bid was already done. We're trying to order them and get them installed after the painting. Unfortunately, there's a lot of blacktop work uh, that resulted in uh, traffic at Butterworth that might be a couple hundred thousand dollars or more. So now we have to you know, dig into that a little bit more per se. So uh, Esser, here, a lot of the good news is a lot of the projects we were doing for HEAC were paid with our CARES fund. If you recall, we had, care, uh, we had CARES or Esser 1, Esser 2, and Esser 3, and that was a total of about $28 million in all of those projects. We had a lot of learning loss activities that we've done. We talk about you know, after school projects, summer school projects, a lot of stuff that happened in addition to large portion of that was our an answer two and three of our, eight, our HVACs. So we have about $18.1 million that was approved for that. Uh, uh, we have spent, the three buildings only cost us 7.4. 7 
Now I'm showing you two others. A year later, it cost us 10 million. But you can see that folks, when we first talked about this, we started saying we'd like to do six elements, six buildings. We're talking about Adams, Butterworth, Logan, Lincoln, Irving, Washington. The sixth one is Jefferson. Now I'm telling you what, it's probably going to have to be at a later date and we're going to repurpose something to, to do that because of the cost and everything going on. It is probably more aggressive than we ever thought it would be as far as increases and everything. So the good news is you're going to have five hopefully completed within that $18 million of investor funds. So and you really have to think about it. There was no direct taxes associated with that to the taxpayers in Moline and Cole Valley School District. The reality is it was paid with taxpayer dollars, but nationwide. So, that, so that, that's good news. But let's talk a little bit about the HVAC uh, budget projects for uh, Lincoln Irving and Washington. You're being asked right now to approve after this board meeting, after the committee holding the board meeting, the really the mechanical and the uh, electrical for those buildings because we anticipate that project to cost 10.2. Why does it cost so much more than the other three? Well, in reality, we knew Logan, and you guys probably didn't know this, but back in the 90s when they air conditioned uh, Roosevelt, they upgraded a lot of Logan to get air conditioned but never followed through. So a lot of the duct work and everything in Logan was done. So that was more, that was probably our easiest project of all those five. So, so that benefited us. But the reality is these Lincoln Irving and Washington are more square footage wise to that. Plus when we did the first three projects this summer, we didn't have a lot of casework in there. And we're finding out, you know, there was a lot more when you're ripping out the, the old system against the wall, we needed probably more casework and some ceilings and stuff like that. And then you gotta think, you know, we have a lot of life health safety issues in tune of our 10 year life health safety that goes through every school and identifies some hazards that you have that, that should be taken care of that we've been slowly uh, taking care of over time. Well, in the two Lincoln Irving and Washington, we have about a quarter million dollars of those. Well, if we did do a sprinkler system in each one of those buildings that would cost maybe 400,000, you would go away from a lot of that 250 and plus you have the ceilings down. So we said, give us some alternative bids for the sprinkler system in those two buildings. And when the superintendent and I brought her to Washington and I said, we didn't do this for Jane Adams. We didn't do it for, for Logan and we didn't do it for Butterworth. I don't know why we didn't do it. I think we just tried to hit the street so quick and get on it. And, and then we said, let's reflect back and see what we should have done. Well, in reality, the 10-year, uh, the, the uh, life house, excuse me, the 10-year facility study plan helps us with some things. Maybe that's why we didn't identify Willard to get air conditioned because we identified it not to be in our long-term future. We also didn't do that with, with Adams. We also did do it up with Logan. But for Washington and Lincoln Irving, that's in our both, both of our plans. So if we spend a little bit of money doing sprinkling, we would save some other costs associated with that of the life health safety. And there's a lot of, a lot of the extra costs in Jane Adams and Butterworth were associated with bringing walls up higher to the ceiling level for smoke, for smoke ventilation. And that's really... If you, if any of you were on the board when Franklin was burned, was burned, it was smoke damage going through the top of the, the wall. So uh, we asked for alternative bids and that's in that project because we think since we have all the ceilings down, it will be the cheapest and the most efficient time to get sprinklers in those two buildings for Lincoln Irving and Washington. So a lot of the cost is associated with that. We also know that we're probably not going to get done in one summer. You know, you only have like 65, 70 working days for the whole summer, this last summer. For what we were trying to do was extremely, extremely aggressive. So for this one, these two projects, we said, well, okay, how can we help that? So we made them bid out two shifts of work, you know, regular and, and second shift. Well, what, had, what that really caused is a lot of bidders did bid because they didn't have the staff to do that and didn't want to allocate next year's summer work 
to that project. So we had about 11 packages bid for these two. And we were fortunate enough to get one bid for mechanical and one bid for uh, electrical. So we can go to you, go to you now and order those in hopes of we might get the chiller in the summer. We might get the electrical panels in, in hopes, hopes, hopes. In reality, we probably won't get it. it. It'll probably be very similar to this project where we'll get a lot of the work done. School can be, uh, be in place on time next year because we also lose a week of, uh, of, of the calendar. Last year, we extended the calendar in, in the school, so that gave us one extra week this summer. But next summer, it doesn't give us an extra one. It just gives us the, the normal one. So there's a lot of challenges that we still have in these two projects. And a lot of the big is, we, out of our 11 bid packages, eight packages were not even bid on by any vendor. So the, the carpenter, the general trades, you know, the flooring, the ceiling, the concrete. And you don't think about that, but a lot of that is because we wanted them to work on double shifts. So we think after talking to you know, the, our architect and, and our construction manager, that if we take that away and maybe let, allow them to do six, you know, 10 hour days, that they'd be more receptive to that and bid out. But if we don't purchase the chillers and all the mechanicals right now, this is very similar like what we were talking a year ago, we have no chance of getting those. So that's what we're doing. We have a very high confidence level that we'll get there. But I'm telling you right now, all I'm asking you for is to approve the mechanicals, the electrical, the painting, and the fire protection that we got bids on. And they were within reason based on the estimates from Russell. There, the other thing is, folks, I'm not telling you we have to do it, but we've been notified if we don't do this by the end of September, these bids are going to go up 20%. Now, not, that's for the mechanical and for the electrical. That's how the market is. It's, it's nuts. So a lot of that even says that's why we should do our sprinklers on these two projects because it's just going to go skyrocketing and both of those buildings are in our long-term future. And that's probably the right thing to do, given it. You won't get to, you won't get to Jefferson, but remember that's half an AM class and a PM class. So you don't have as, as much instruction going on at one setting. It doesn't help the employees and, and everybody else, and it's not the best environment, but it's not the worst thing. The good thing is you can get five buildings done with CARES funds in a two and a half year period. That is phenomenal, mm -hmm. but that's the good news. But there is some disappointment and things that it's still challenging. I'm not sure. I know one thing based on this summer. I'm not going to tell Lincoln Irving staff, Washington staff, the community, the principals, the administration that there's going to be air conditioning after next summer. I know that's probably not going to happen. But I think we can get to the point where we can have be ready for the same similar education environment and then add the chillers and the electrical as needed. But it's going to be challenging, probably more challenging than this year, but who knows. The next thing is, I talked a little bit about this, the timeframes. We're going to do everything we can to kind of get get as much done inside that building next summer as we can in the 65 working days we have. Uh, we talked about six buildings. Now it's probably looking like five. I've told you about our budget to actual cost. And then Leak and Irving, we talked about the bids, the casework, the ceilings, the sprinkler system, that scope was added. So when we said we would do five, six buildings, that's without this much addition to these two buildings. But even if it is, it's all about the cost of labor and the timeline that we know. These bids are higher because we're requiring them to do, do two shifts to try to help to get out of there. Uh, miscellaneous, you know, you, we got to think about long-term planning. We, we talk about that. We're, you know, we, we're on year two and a half of this AC, HVAC project, but we got to think about the next updated project and and you know, we have a facility study. It was just redone. It's fresh. It's new. It's it's not much different than the one that was done 12 years before, nor would it be if we had another one. So it's a good plan, it's a sound plan, it's been vetted for a while. So I think we need to start talk, talking about the next major project that this board wants to tackle. You know, and I said last March, it wasn't then, and I'm not saying it today, but someday 
but some days a lot closer now because we're six months later. Because there's a lot of things we have to do if we pick an elementary project or more items at the high school. You know, there's a lot of planning that has to take and go in place for that. So, so with that, that's all I'm going to talk about now. Um, if you have any questions, especially about what's on the budget to be approved uh, tonight, I'd be glad to answer it. Otherwise, uh, we'll think about the next project and help soon these get done right. <laughs> What are the other packages going back out? Or are they? We just got we we just we just vetted we just vetted through everything last week to get to this board meeting. So I think we're gonna so tomorrow. <laughs> I, think I would say we're debating when's a better time because we think a lot, we're early enough that a lot of the vendors and companies did not bid because they don't want to be locked into this project and especially with all the costs. So I would say we're contemplating somewhere like you know Thanksgiving before before you know Christmas because the, that time gets lost and we've been if you remember that's when we bid aspire and that's not the best time to bid. So I would say probably right around Thanksgiving or or a little sooner. Anything else? All right. With that, I need a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any objection to going straight into the meeting or do people need a break? District. It is in the College Professional Development Room. Can I please have a roll call? Audrey Adamson. Here. Justin Anderson. Present. Chet Smet. Here. Kate Schaefer. Here. Maria S. Trigueros. Andrew Weyert. Here. Aaron Waldron Smith. Here. We all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the minutes. A, the minutes of the open session of the regular Board of Education meeting of August 22nd, 2002. Can I have a motion, please? Seven. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Minutes of the closed session of the regular board meeting of education of August 22nd, 2022. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any comments, public? No, nope. we do not. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. Okay, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the actions contained in consent agenda item A and C through P as presented. I have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Check this Metz. All right. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Andrew Weyert? Aye. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Justin Anderson? Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith? Aye. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the actions contained in the consent agenda item B as amended. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Roll call. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Andrew Weyert? Aye. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Justin Anderson? Aye. Chet DeSmet? Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith? Aye. All right, number six, the approval of the memorandum of understanding. I hate that word. Recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the memorandum of understanding between the Moline Coal Valley School District number 40 and the Moline Foundation for the Scaling Transformative Advanced Manufacturing Pathways stamp grant, which will benefit those students choosing the manufacturing career pathway program. Could I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Andrew Weyert? Aye. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Justin Anderson? Aye. Chet DeSmet? Aye. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith? Aye. All right. Reports, requests, and open discussion. Dr. Savage. Okay. We're looking forward to our Board of Education Forum for interested school board candidates. 
The event will take place this Thursday evening at the Bartlett Performing Arts Center beginning at 6.30 p.m. I'm happy that Rock Island and United Township Districts are also uh, joining us for this event and we're grateful for the invitation. Each will send two or three Board of Education members along with their superintendents. We're looking forward to sharing this opportunity with community members so they may make an informed choice in terms of their potential candidacy. I um, mean, I believe we will post this as a Board of Education event so any members wishing to attend, attend may do so. Um, it is hard to believe, but we already have two solid weeks of instruction uh, under our belts and kids, families, and staff are beginning to settle into the structures and routines of a normal school year. I believe we are off to a fantastic start and would like to personally thank the staff for all they did to ensure we had a positive launch. There are many events happening at each of our schools and homecoming is right around the corner of uh, the week of October 10th. There are opportunities to celebrate the achievement and talents of our students this fall all over the district. And I invite the Board of Education and community members uh, to come out and see them in action. And then lastly, our first half day of school improvement uh, is scheduled for next Wednesday, the 21st. And we're looking forward to this opportunity to jump into the work that's associated with our strategic goals and overall school improvement process. So we're looking forward to getting that work underway. And that is all I have. Um, can I just, if you are interested in coming to the forum or coming, can everyone let me know? Is everyone chat you're coming? Justin? Probably. Okay. Audrey? Okay. Copy there. Yeah. All right. So I did ask that it get posted just so we're following the rules, even though we're not doing any Open business. Meetings, right? I'm more comfortable having <clears throat> it posted just so we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. So that's why. Um, I want to thank Dr. Savage for jumping in when I was like, let's do this. So I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. DeBain and Dr. Pribble. There is nothing more important than communicating with our parents and standard making it consistent across the district. So thank you for taking that charge and making it easy for our families. Um, anybody have anything else for discussion? I just wanted to say that um, this weekend I had an opportunity to experience a former student who's now a teacher in the district, not part of our program originally, but um, interact with two of the people that um, inspired her to become a teacher. And it was, it was really cool to see her you know, interact with those teachers. There was a quiver in her voice when she spoke to them, like she was really nervous and it was, but it was also made me feel really good to know that the teachers we've had in our district for a long time inspired our students, even without the program. And they've come home. Sure. Um, just real quick for our forum, um, I'm going to do an introduction. The superintendents have some slides to show. Then we're going to talk about our experience. If people have questions, we can answer them to the best of our ability. It's really to give people a realistic idea of what it means to be a school board member and what they can expect being on a school board and who better to give out that information than people who are already doing it. Um, okay, anybody else? Yes. Say for that then, do you want us each to have something small to sh share, whether we want something prepared or to make sure that we're not saying ditto seven times, you know, across the board, if there's any discussion about if there's certain Yeah, if you points. would like to prepare something small to share, feel free. Um, I'm really hoping we have a good turnout. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I know that um, all three districts have uh, promoted out to their families um, and have utilized social media. We'll be doing another reminder to all of our families um, probably tomorrow. So I, and again, I was telling Erin, I actually received the invitation from the Quad City Chamber. I saw that today. So I'm not Quad sure, Chamber but that was kind so. of fun to get, yeah, to receive absolutely. our invitation from another uh, community entity. So that was great. I just also am really proud of the fact that our district schools are coming together and doing this as a whole. I just, it's pretty cool. It is yeah. pretty cool and I'm pretty proud of that and mm -hmm. I can't wait to do this. There are a few opportunities where we where we have the chance to work yeah. together in a in a you know something that is not competitive in nature and it's something that benefits all of our communities and I have to say 
you know, I extended to our region, but our closest neighbors at United Township and um, Rock Island were really grateful that we were hosting this and really grateful to have been invited. All right, so going on to number eight, closed session is to consider the collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want that strict. No. Okay. Yes. I have a motion to go into open questions. Please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. The motion is that the Board of Education approve a three year agreement between the Moling Education Support Personnel, MASPA, and the Moling Cool Valley Board of Education for the 2022, 2023, 2023, 2024, and 2024, 2025 20, school years. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Justin Anderson? Aye. Chet DeSmet? Aye. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Andrew Weyer? Aye. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith? Aye. All right. Could I please have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.